Hello again, friends, and welcome to Access City Hall. It's the September 2018 episode. I'm Stu Levitan. Thanks for being with us. Up in the morning and out to school, teachers teaching the golden rule. American history, practical math, you study hard, hoping to pass. Working your fingers right down to the bone, and the guy behind you won't leave you alone. Ring, ring goes the bell. The cook in the lunchroom's ready to sell. You're lucky if you can find a seat. You're fortunate if you have time to eat. Back in the classroom, open your books. Gee, but the teacher don't know how mean she looks. That's how the poet laureate of American teenagers, Chuck Berry, saw the high school experience 60 years ago. But what of the experience today in Madison's high schools and middle schools and elementary schools? Well, that's what we're about to find out, at least from the perspective of the person in charge of them. The Madison Metropolitan School District is the second largest school district in Wisconsin with over 27,000 students and 5,500 employees in 50 schools spread over 65 square miles, including not only Madison, but also all or part of the city of Fitchburg, the villages of Maple Bluff and Shorewood Hills, and the towns of Blooming Grove, Burke, and Madison. The district has a diverse student body, with about 57% identifying as non-white, including 20% Hispanic, 18% African American, 9% Asian, and 9% multiracial. Students come from homes where more than 100 languages are spoken, and 27% of them have limited proficiency in English. 48% of the students are low income, and 14% receive special education services. The teaching staff is not quite as diverse. As of October 2017, 87% of Madison's 2,774 teachers were white. Close to 70%, or 1,918, were women. The district will spend about $407 million in the 2018-2019 school year to operate its 32 elementary schools, 12 middle schools, four comprehensive high schools, and two alternative secondary schools. That's down from $420 million just three years ago. The person responsible for submitting that budget and then making sure the money is spent as authorized is, of course, the superintendent, Jennifer Cheatham, whom the school board hired in April 2013. Dr. Cheatham is a native of the Chicago suburbs and a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Harvard Urban Superintendents Program. She had hoped to begin her teaching career in the Chicago public schools, but fate and the late 90s job market took her instead to Northern California in 1997 and a job teaching eighth grade language arts in the Newark Unified School District, about halfway between Oakland and San Jose. In 2003, she joined the Bay Area School Reform Collaborative in a coaching and professional development role. Shockingly, she then left the wonders of the Bay Area for the quite different world of far Southern California as Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction for San Diego City Schools. She finally made it to the Chicago school system in 2009 as a so-called mini-superintendent, overseeing 25 schools. In 2011, she became chief of instruction and secured adoption of new standards for math and literacy, a longer school day, and a controversial plan tying teacher evaluations to test scores before coming to Madison two years later. Notwithstanding her somewhat peripatetic professional past, she says that she's in Madison for the long haul, and in fact, this is or will soon be her longest career stop. We are taping August 28th. School starts a week from today. Dr. Cheatham, two or three words to describe how you feel as you start your sixth school year here. Oh my gosh. I'm very impressed by your uh, listing of my experiences. Uh, thank you for that, Stu. It was a little uh, trip down memory lane <laughs> for me. Um, three words, re-energized. Um, mindful and focused. Focused on? I'm focused on the vision and goals that we've just set in our new strategic framework um, and uh, our goal to make more transformational change in the years to come. Did you say energized or re-energized? Re-energized. Had there been a lull over the past couple of years where were you needed to re-energize yeah. yourself? I mean, I think that the work that we do in education, I think this is not just true of me, but uh, every educator that I know, and I know a lot of them, um, it is a emotionally challenging work, right? It's inherently emotional because it's about children. 
Um, and it's easy to find yourself giving much of your emotional energy and uh, feeling somewhat drained at points. So finding ways to be re-energized, refocused, um, is a critically important part of the work that we do. I've been learning more about how important it is for um, if we are to serve students well, we have to be uh, well ourselves. How, and, and there's stuff in the strategic uh, uh, framework that, that relates to that, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. How does the emotional pressure and drain on an, edu an educational administrator compare to that on a frontline teacher? You know, that's a really good question. I mean, I, th I, I w wouldn't want to compare. Um, well, you've been both. Yeah. So, so I mean, how I, has it felt to you? I think for, uh, let me speak for myself. Yeah. I think that as a teacher, um, you have to be, you have to be fully present from the moment you walk into that classroom at the beginning of the day, from the moment you leave it at the end, right? I mean, you are um, uh, taking care of the, you know, 20, 25 for me, maybe around 30 students who are in my classroom um, every day, all day long. And uh, just the mere ability to be present and available and observant for that sustained period of time every day. Um, yeah, I mean, that is, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, an experience that I think is hard to, to describe. Um, as an administrator, I think um, you have the luxury of, uh, you know, at least the ability to take a bathroom break <laughs> when you need to, um, which is good. Um, and, uh, but there's a, a feeling of being constantly under the microscope, I think, in these public administrator roles, principal, superintendent. Um, and that has its own uh, kind of drain. And, uh, and instead, we want everyone in our profession to be able to be themselves, to bring themselves uh, as human people <laughs> to their work every day, which means not only our strengths, but our challenges, right? We want people to take risks. Um, it's hard to do that when you're constantly under public scrutiny, right? I mean, it's just a no whole other layer of, um, yeah, of challenge. And it's astonishing to me that people step up to these jobs over and over again. I mean, you guys, everyone, please, not only give a teacher uh, a pat on the back, but give your school administrators one too. Um, it's uh, a phenomenally rewarding profession, and it's a phenomenally challenge, challenging profession. It, it makes it a beautiful thing. Are there times that you miss classroom teaching? All the time. Oh yeah, I miss it a lot. Do you um, ever think that, that someday you'll go back to it? Um, you know, I, I think, I hope someday that I'll have the opportunity to teach again. I don't know if it'll be middle schoolers <laughs> like it was the first time around. Um, well, maybe I'll find myself in another setting where I get to um, share the experience and knowledge I've accumulated over these years. Um, that's a long ways off, though. Okay. Well, let's talk about what we've got in front of us is what in front of you is as you start the new school year a week from today. Yeah. Um, the big news is the new strategic framework that uh, the board adopted uh, shortly uh, a short time ago. Um, let's first let's talk about what the first strategic framework consisted of and what it accomplished, especially mm -hmm. as regards to African American students. The first strategic framework, which we created and launched five years ago, um, was created with an eye towards um, uh, raising student achievement for all and beginning to make an impact on narrowing and closing gaps and opportunity that lead to gaps in achievement um, with a primary focus on the gap uh, that exists for African American young people. Um, our strategy for addressing uh, those gaps in opportunity uh, and achievement was uh, primarily in that first framework about 
uh, building coherence as a school system. We had too much variation. Um, it was uh, very difficult to guarantee for any parent um, that their child was gaining access to the grade level uh, core instructional experiences that we wanted every child to have. Um, so we focused on that. Um, we focused on making sure that every school has a school improvement plan with clear goals and a strategy for reaching those goals. Um, we made sure to focus on uh, defining for our school system what we believe great teaching looks like. Great teaching that's culturally responsive and linguistically responsive. Um, and then aligning our systems to that definition of great teaching our hiring strategy, our induction strategy, our professional development, our evaluation system. Um, so another form of coherence building. Um, and we worked really hard on establishing some of the fundamental tools and resources we felt that our uh, staff, school-based staff, needed to get the job done. Um, uh, core literacy curricula, um, K uh, through 12 core mathematics curriculum um, as examples, uh, uh, clear plans for providing services for English language learners, students with disabilities, and advanced learners. Um, I hope you get the theme here. I mean, it was all about making sure that we were strengthening the foundation of our school system with the thinking that there's no way you can raise student achievement and narrow uh, achievement gaps without having a coherent system. Um, and I think that that framework has delivered uh, on that promise. We have more coherence as a result. Our, I think our school system is just simply stronger and higher functioning as a result. And we have seen um, a nice incremental improvement over the last five years, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. And that was after um, a, a long period of uh, of, of no improvement, of, of fairly flat results and achievement. So we're now on an upward trajectory. Um, I'm excited that we have the foundation, I think, to, to make even more progress in the future. The, the numbers over the past five years do look pretty good, um, especially for African-American students, gains in early literacy and in reading and math and, mm -hmm. and so on. The um, graduation rate jumped from the mid-50s to about 73, 74%, which yeah. is actually where it was in the mid-60s. Oh, is that right? Interesting. In, in, in the mid-60s, the African-American graduation rate was 74, 75%. So you've, you've, over five decades, you've gotten back to where you were All right. in, in, in the 60s. More work to do. But, but the numbers over the past five years are good. Do you know what accounts for all of them? Do you, do, can you pinpoint of the things in that first strategic framework mm -hmm. what worked and, and what might or might not have. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, the, the more disciplined ways of working that we have established have certainly led to stronger outcomes across the board. Um, I mean, it's just more about uh, paying close attention to student performance, using data to drive decision making at the school level. Um, at the high school level, the graduation rates um, are very interesting. When I saw that data released earlier this year, of course I immediately dug into it with our team. Um, uh, I wanted to see it broken out by all the high schools and I was pleased to see um, that the results weren't just a simply a one-year spike but the result of gradual improvement across uh, the four comprehensive high schools in particular. Um, while uh, still um, improving the average uh, GPA, which is really important, right? So this isn't just about churning out graduates, but um, getting students, more students graduated ready for college, career, and community. I think the high schools have, um, oh my gosh, we have so much more work to do. It's hard to talk about accomplishments when you're uh, so focused on uh, the next phase. But um, I, I've got to congratulate the high schools. I think that their results uh, have happened because of their attention on individual students, right? Identifying those students that are off track, intervening with them as individuals, and finding a pathway for them to graduate. You just used, you just said a sentence that's actually from 
the, uh, the new strategic framework that the school district's vision is, quote, every school will be a thriving school that prepares every student to graduate ready for college, career, and community. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have a 100% graduation rate to satisfy that goal? I think so. Is that, re <laughs> is that realistically attainable? I think that, that um, it is the goal that we have to strive for. We have to strive for it. I mean, students, um, in order to have a, a, a decent chance um, at success after high school, they've got to have that diploma in hand. Um, I mean, there are certainly are alternative ways, right, of getting uh, uh, graduated so that you can go on to a post-secondary option. It may not be necessarily the traditional high school diploma, but that's what we want. It's got to be the goal that we strive for, absolutely. You're going to measure that by a, a number of levels, reading proficiency, reading growth, math proficiency, uh, uh, four-year completion rate. Of those benchmarks, which is the most important? Gosh, um, you know, I don't know that I can say that. The three goals that we've set for the school district, one is about students being on track to graduate, one is about culture and climate, the third is about African American youth excelling in school. Oh, I've, we got th we, 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 yeah. I've got the three goals. Oh, we're going to we're gonna get to each goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The metrics that are underneath mm -hmm. all of them are meant to serve as a package because there is no single indicator um, that uh, we think um, uh, drives our efforts towards success. It, 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 you have to look across indicators. So I don't think there's any particular one that stands out. It is about the the package of indicators that point towards students' uh, ability to be prepared for life after high school. Are they going to uh, travel in, in tandem, or are the, are the metrics going to be related to each other, or, or are you going to find, is it possible that you could find them out of kilter, that, that your, your middle school and, and, and your elementary school metrics are ticking up, but your graduation yeah. rate is not? Well, that's precisely the point. I think that's why we have to have a package of indicators, because you could see one metric moving up um, uh, while other metrics are, are not, or perhaps moving down. I mean, uh, when we created the original strategic framework, we were really intentional about having goals and metrics that sort of counterbalanced one another. So if we only focused on academic outcomes, we could actually do so by creating a culture and climate in schools that is punitive, right? That's actually worse um, for the well-being of both students and staff. So we wanted to set goals around both the academics and culture and climate, right? Uh, it's, it's important to have goals and metrics that counterbalance one another. Um, too often in during the standards movement over the last 20 years, um, people have, because of the, the singular focus on academic success, have um, narrowed the curriculum, right? You've seen in some school districts, not here, you've seen opportunities to uh, participate in the arts go away, right? You've seen the kind of uh, opportunities that create a well-rounded child diminished over the years because of the focus on uh, a singular metric like um, like reading, for example. Reading's important. We're absolutely committed to making sure that every child can read, but it shouldn't be at the detriment of all the other experiences that help students develop the skills and abilities that they need to be successful I in mean, life. You've even got a school that teaches, teaches students how to grow food and cook in the kitchen. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Jen Cheatham. She is the superintendent of the Madison School District, now about to enter her sixth school year here, which is a long time for, for her. Has moved around a lot. We're going to take a short pause for the cause. We'll be back with more. It is Access City Hall on the Madison City Channel for September 2018. Please stay with us. So, so we, we were, were walking, walking to school. I started thinking about lunch. Mom packed me turkey and cheese. She's I smart. Really cheese pizza. Sometimes her mind wanders. We should have a sleepover. I remember saying, Laura? I think I heard Laura. mom say something. The sign says don't walk. Sometimes it's so overwhelming. I really hope she doesn't I have really another bad day. I really hope I don't have another school bad day, day at school today. When you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. Go to understood.org, a free online resource with support and tools to help your child thrive. 
Welcome back to Access City Hall for September 2018. It is the back to school episode. We're talking with school superintendent Jennifer Cheatham. Uh, we're, and we're focusing right now on the newly adopted strategic framework, which is a, a beautiful document, a multicolored, uh, glossy uh, brochure, which the, uh, the, the graphics folks at, this, at the school district have really uh, gone above and beyond to, to put together a really nice presentation to, and to back up uh, the language. Get to goal number two that the district and every school in it is a place where children, staff, and families thrive. And this is measured by a number of survey questions, which are called survey power questions. And then three things I want to focus on, percent and number of teachers of color, staff retention, and school safety climate survey power question okay. for students, staff, and parents. Let's start with the percent and number of teachers of color. Is there, well, first of all, how important is it for a non-white student, especially a young black male, to have a teacher who looks like them? I think it's incredibly important. And um, uh, it's, it's incredibly important for a student of color. I think it is also very important for white students to have uh, teachers of color. Um, but the research on the positive effect for an African-American youth, for example, to have an African-American teacher is very clear and compelling. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's undeniable. I mean, there's, there's, there's statistics, there's numbers yeah. that, that say uh, a student with a teacher that they can culturally and personally relate to. Perform is, better. Perform better yeah. and stay in school better. Absolutely. Yeah, and just by having one teacher, um, right during a period of years. It's not uh, that they will perform better while they're in that classroom, but, but it has a positive effect for, um, for years to come. Even having one teacher that looks like you. Um, I mean, it's, it's really such a powerful thing, um, which is why we've set the goal um, for ourselves. Is, is there a, an optimal percent or number of non-white teachers in a school? Uh, does it is it supposed to have a, a direct correlation with the racial demographics of the student body, or, or how do you know when you got it right? I don't think we, we know that for sure. I don't think we have put an, an optimal, optimal number out there. I think, I mean, we would love uh, for the staff demographics to be proportionate <laughs> to the student demographics. I mean, as, as you just mentioned, that would, uh, I think, be an ideal state. Um, and it's a real challenge. I mean, it's, uh, we've put this goal out there, which I think is really important, with the full recognition that there aren't enough uh, people uh, of any racial background entering into our beloved profession right now, right? We need more people to sign up to become future teachers. Um, and there's a shortage of teachers of color everywhere. Um, we worked with an HR, a human resources consultant, uh, several years ago to help us think about how to improve our work in that space. Um, one of the things we focused on is the diversity of our workforce. And at the time, um, you know, we've always been uh, cognizant of the work that we need to do around recruitment um, of teachers uh, to Madison. But what we learned is that the, probably the fastest way and the most effective way for us to diversify our workforce is to um, find ways for our students to become our future teachers, right? That's, that's it. And I actually think it is an indicator of health in our community. If our own students are becoming our future teachers, it says something about the health of the Madison community as a whole. But that's, that's a long process. I mean, it is. I mean, because there's, you got, they got to get got to go to college. Yep. They got to get you know they got to get certified. Yeah. I mean that's that's a several year process. That's not going to solve an immediate shortage. No, and nothing will. <laughs> that that answer is not out there. There is no uh, no immediate solution to solving that problem. Recruitment efforts will get us some incremental gains, and we've already seen that uh, beginning to happen in our district. Um, year over year, we have hired uh, more and more teachers of color, which is wonderful, um, uh, but it's never going to get us to the kind of proportionality that we just talked about. Um, we have to have a short game and a long game. Um, I think that's critical. 
back in the 60s when, when the issue of non-white teachers first occurred to the board mm -hmm. uh, met in the Madison School System, in the early 60s, Philip Falk was, was the superintendent, and his attitude was, if the most qualified applicant is non-white, sure, we'll hire them, but we're not going to go out and, and look for them, and we're really not, and, and we're not going to engage in any sort of affirmative action where we're just not going to engage in affirmative action. And then by the mid-60s, they started trying, but we're coming up against the the shortage and the, yeah. wh why would we move to Wisconsin? Um, what strategies, what particular strategies are you doing now to get past the recruitment issues um, and, and get those teachers and retain them? Um, I think we should come back to retention, but when it comes to recruitment, um, not only have we, I think, done a better job um, reaching out to institutions that train future teachers, um, not just here in Madison, but uh, um, in other institutions. Um, we have, in addition to that recruitment effort, uh, expanded our Grow Our Own program over time, which Did is that about students becoming. Well, it's got a couple of strands. We've got a wonderful partnership with the UW uh, Madison School of Education called Forward Madison. Um, that partnership is. Uh, aimed largely at helping more uh, people uh, find their way into our profession, and specifically people of color. And uh, under the Forward Madison umbrella is a Grow Our Own program for staff to teachers, so educational assistants, special education assistants, um, who have real talent working with children, observable talent, that we think would become wonderful future teachers. Um, we essentially pay for their schooling um, so they can become teachers in Madison, which is wonderful. Um, and in addition to that, we have um, our, our student program uh, called Team Scholars. And there are about 30 students already in that program. The first uh, cohort graduated this last spring um, in June and are now attending college. And I know it's a long game, but the goal is that we're going to support them and help them come back to us as teachers um, in what I think is actually the very near future. So we've got multiple strands uh, uh, helping us with these efforts. I think the question about retention is maybe um, just as important, if not more important. Um, we're not going to be able to successfully recruit teachers from elsewhere, um, our own staff, or our own students to become future teachers if they don't see the Madison school system as a supportive and positive place for them to work. Um, retention is a challenge. Um, I think, as we mentioned, uh, being a teacher has, uh, uh, I think, become harder. Um, so retention is an issue across the board for every teacher. We need to make sure that every teacher feels a sense of belonging and support um, in our school district. Um, but we've, we've talked quite a lot with uh, Teachers of Color Advisory Group uh, that we've worked with for the last couple of years. Uh, it's about, you know, probably about 15 teachers of color that we work with very closely to better understand their experience and their colleagues' experience in our school system. Um, and they have provided some powerful recommendations about what we can and must do to better support um, uh, teachers of color and I would say staff of color more generally if we're going to retain them. In terms of the district's relationship with the UW teaching program in, I would say, 1967, there was a, a graduate of the program who was supposed to be a student teacher at La Follette, mm. um, and uh, the principal refused to accept him because he had a goatee, and he ended up going to Rhode Island. Oh, well, I've heard the that, story. That, that was um, um, Principal Vandermeulen, a father of a current board member. Yeah. It's an interesting story. <laughs> um, continuing in, in with goal number two about uh, students thriving, the last category, the last um, measure, measurement metric. Me metric is school safety climate survey power question. Mm -hmm. um, why, base, why is the metric a survey question rather than actual statistics 
of actual safety-related incidents? That's a really good question. We wanted to be able to measure safety in some way, shape, or form um, as it relates to the second goal um, on school climate. And we debated um, which metric was the most powerful one. In the end, we decided that a student or parent or staff members perception of school safety right their feeling at school was the most important thing that we could measure um, so that's what we're going to do uh, we'll have to determine exactly uh, which question on the climate survey gets to that there is a question right now that says i feel safe at school or something like that um, and that will likely be the question that we choose it's simple it's elegant it gets right to the point um, and it measures something that's hard to measure otherwise, which is beyond physical safety, right? But it gets at like psychological safety, emotional well-being, um, which we think is uh, just as important as students' physical safety. What will you take from a conclusion that if, 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 if the survey is out of kilter with the actual statistics, mm -hmm. if the statistics say, yes, this is a safe school, and the survey says, we don't feel safe. Yeah. How, how do you, what does that tell you? I don't know. I mean, I think it, it, it raises a red flag, though. Um, and it would likely lead to a school team, um, leadership team, uh, talking with the, the survey respondents, right? Bringing together a focus group. Why? I mean, to, to, to ask the question, why? Um, the survey, none of these metrics will tell you the whole story, right? They're gonna raise red flags. Um, if there are problems that, that a school team will have to dig into um, or a school system will have to dig into. Um, uh, yeah, but I think that those kind of discrepancies are powerful um, and really help you get to the core of an issue. We're going to stick with, with the issue of safety, and we're going to, we'll, we'll get back to goal three in, in, in a moment. But I'm going to yeah. go down to uh, a uh, plan that's under a category, We Will Streamline Priorities, talking about the behavior education plan. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is what the report says, or the framework says. We've learned an incredible amount about behavior support and what it takes to make sure every school and classroom is a safe and supportive one. We'll take what we've learned and work with students, staff, and families to strengthen our approach. We know that our move to proactive behavior support and restorative, restorative practices is the right direction. And by taking a step back to improve our policy and systems, we can ensure we have the right district-wide support for implementation while fostering school-based strategies and innovations aimed at strengthening relationships and students' sense of belonging. As I work through that sentence or that paragraph, it sounds as though you're acknowledging that some of the criticism of the BEP has been valid mm -hmm. and that when we note that high school suspensions are up 32 percent, have you in fact been letting the small stuff slide to the detriment and you need to refocus the enforcement? Yeah, I think we're acknowledging just that. I think that we... Um, know that punitive disciplinary policies and practices have a negative effect ultimately on student behavior. I mean, it's what we kind of impulsively want to do because we were all raised that way, right? I mean, that's um, uh, uh, the, the reality and we know it doesn't work. So we know that shifting away to build relationship with students, to get at the root cause of the behavior um, is still the right work. And it's been some of the most challenging and complex work that we've embarked upon. Um, it, we are, um, this is emerging practice across the country, right? I mean, we're all, all of us who are engaged in it are learning together about what works and what doesn't. Um, in this framework, we are definitely committed to using the lessons that we've learned um, to strengthen our approach. We have uh, a wonderful committee um, that, in addition to the work that we're already doing to support schools and improving our approach, 
Alongside that, we have an ad hoc committee of the board led by Gloria Reyes, um, who's one of our uh, newest board members. And a former cop. Yeah, happens to be a former cop. Um, she is leading an ad hoc committee of the board to help um, us all uh, kind of take stock of those lessons to revise the behavior policy itself this year um, and to solidify any changes in practice district-wide that we want to make in the future. Um, so we're, we're really excited about applying those lessons learned. But when you, when you say that you think the district may have erred in, in letting small stuff slide, mm -hmm. what, what, what did you mean by that and how, and how what, what's, how do you fix that? What, well, what, what does it mean to not let the small stuff slide? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I, I think what I'm expressing is what I've heard from our staff um, over these last several years, that there has been something about our commitment to understanding the root cause of the behavior and using restorative practice that has, um, in some cases, I think, unintentionally sent the message that we are lowering expectations for student behavior. Um, and the, the place that plays out the most is in the classroom as it relates to the small stuff. Um, that's what I'm hearing from our staff. That's what I'm hearing from students and families. So I think our acknowledgement is that um, we need to empower staff who work in the classroom. I'm, I'm too far away to tell a staff member what to do when a child um, misbehaves in small ways in a classroom, right? Staff need to feel empowered um, to make really good, solid decisions that help students see what the high expectation is for their, their um, uh, scholarly behavior in the classroom while also expressing to students how much teachers care for them um, and want to understand why they're behaving the way that they are. What do you say to that, that you know, geometry teacher, that physics teacher who says, look, I want to teach them physics, I want to teach them geometry, I don't want to know about their home life. I don't want, I'm not a social worker. I'm a teacher. If they act up, I'm sending them to study hall and getting them out of my class because I got kids I got to teach the Pythagorean theorem to. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, Stu, but we sign up for this profession, I would hope, because we want to teach the children, right? It's not about teaching the subject. It's great and important to feel passionate about the subject that you teach, but if you're not passionate about teaching the children, which requires building trust, building relationship, um, then, then I think there's a fundamental problem. Are there people who are leaving the profession either in Madison or around the country because they, 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 are, they recognize that, that, discrep that disconnect between teaching the subject and teaching the children and realize that their, their way of doing things is, is not the way anymore? I think that may be true. Yeah, I think that may be true. I think our profession is evolving, right? I mean, it is just naturally changing. And uh, in order to be successful in our profession, um, we have to be uh, relationship builders, trust builders with students, because that's the only way a student will allow you um, to, uh, to enter into deep and challenging work, right? Uh, learning is about productive struggle. You're not gonna allow yourself to struggle if you don't trust your teacher. Life is struggle, and then, That's right. and then, and then we take a break for a commercial. <laughs> We're gonna take a short pause for the calls. Be back with uh, Jen Cheatham and more on Access City Hall for September 2018 on the Masson City Channel. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to Access City Hall for September 2018. It's the Back to School episode. I'm still Stu, you're still you. We're still talking with School Superintendent Jennifer Cheatham about the uh, recently adopted strategic framework. Goal three, uh, African American children and youth excel in school. And what I find interesting about your measurements here, you talk about grade three reading proficiency, grade eight math, grade nine on track. Goal one talked about just general proficiency and growth and, and levels. This goal pegs it to specific grades. And why is this the only goal that's got the specific grade levels mentioned for what seemed to be a related concept of, of tracking educational attainment? That's an uh, excellent question, Stu. I think um, goal one and two uh, we will disaggregate all of our data across all those metrics for every student group, in including African American youth. But in this particular goal, I mean, I hope it's obvious, we are striving for more than simply improvement in results for African American youth. We want African American youth to excel, which means we want their um, their results to match their incredible potential, right, as young people. Um, so we've chosen a set of metrics that we think um, represent uh, critical junctures where we want to hold ourselves accountable for making sure that African American youth are indeed um, on track to excel in school. Um, third grade reading is a great example. I mean, we all probably know um, the research around uh, this particular benchmark. If a student isn't reading proficiently by third grade, they're likely going to struggle uh, for the rest of their years in school. Um, so uh, we're holding ourselves accountable for making sure that we're doing everything we have to do to ensure that um, African American youth are uh, at much greater numbers reaching this critical benchmark each year. What does that mean, holding ourselves accountable? Yeah, I, um, I, when, I, when we set this goal and determined the set of metrics, I know I was personally worried that it, we would um, kind of reproduce this narrative that is all about the low performance of African American youth. Um, I wanted for us to work hard to set a goal and a set of related metrics that were not about uh, pointing towards the performance of black children, but pointing towards our own performance in serving black children. Um, because I think that is, um, I mean, that's why we've set this goal. This but, but, what, a, what does it mean to hold yourself accountable? Does, is that, uh, does, oh. does, that, does that mean? You know, we, we come back in five years, if, if, if these numbers right. don't go, you know, you know you're going to get fired, the school board is going to resign. I mean, what, what does holding ourselves accountable mean? Now I understand your question. Yes. Um, thanks for asking a second time <laughs> in a slightly different way. Um, a little more forceful. Think, yeah, yes. a little more forceful. It means uh, for us being held accountable by the community and um, what you'll see in the framework is a commitment not just to the goal and the metrics, but a way of working um, uh, in support of black excellence. We have um, committed to working with what will soon be a community coalition of uh, black people in Madison um, that uh, will not only help us uh, further define our strategies over time because we don't think we've got all the answers. We have to work with a larger Madison community, um, but we also want that coalition to hold us accountable um, for our progress on these goals. Uh, other uh, strategies uh, un underneath uh, this goal is empowering school communities, including empower principals along with school teams. Uh, and then we're going to get back to empowering principals. Uh, hopefully we'll have time. Mm -hmm. the, the next is, is invest in people. And, and most people would, would look at that, that bullet and say, oh, it's gonna, you're talking about you know, paying them more money or you know, hiring more people. But what, what this turns out to be is about culturally responsive teaching. Yeah. And there's a, a sentence in here I want to read. 
uh, it's talking about great teaching framework and, and being culturally and linguistically responsive. It says, while educators must be well-versed in culturally responsive teaching practices, every employee needs to function from a common understanding about the history and effects of racism, structural racism, and implicit bias. As I read that sentence, it strikes me that the first clause relates to teachers mm -hmm. and the rest relates to everybody else in the school system. Now, yeah. as long as a custodian doesn't do or say racist things, what does it matter to the district whether she has a common understanding of the history and effects of structural racism? Mm. We think that every member of the school staff is a member of the team that supports young people and their families. Everyone. I mean, if you're working with us in our school district, you are serving students and families. And um, if you're su serving students and families, um, we think you have an obligation to understand the challenges we face, um, why we're facing them, um, so that you can be a member of the team that helps us uh, get after it. That's why. What percentage of teachers and support staff do you think are, as they say, woke? <laughs> and and what, what percent, conversely, what percent do you need to do some heavy lifting on to get them to, the, to have that understanding of, of racism and structural racism and implicit bias? I'm not going to dare put a percentage okay. on that, Stu. I have no way. But um, I will say that you know, I spent this past year talking with people about where we wanted to go in this next framework. I talked with 2,000 people about um, in about 100 different meetings. I was at every single one with the exception of only a couple. Um, and I was struck by the broad commitment um, to uh, to be woke, right? To be um, uh, on the journey to become uh, more uh, keenly aware of our own racial identities, the impact that has on the way we do our work, um, and to be on the journey to uh, understand um, not only oneself, but uh, the students and families that we serve, um, which I think is incredibly, uh, I used the word re-energizing before. Mm -hmm. That was re-energizing for me. Um, it really, I was so impressed. Um, I talked with our staff. I met with almost every staff member at these voluntary meetings throughout the district and asked them what they thought about taking on an anti-racist stance, right, as um, activist teachers, right? Like what? How do you react to uh, this term? Like, is that something you embrace? Is it? make you nervous. Um, and again, I was just so impressed by teachers' desire to um, be proud of their identities, not just as educators, but as anti-racist educators, which means you're actively working on understanding the lens that you, through which you see the world, um, but uh, identifying and dismantling um, examples of both individual and institutional racism, and not just dismantling, but, but working together to replace uh, that system with one that provides more opportunity for students, that ensures that the classroom instruction is uh, liberating for all students um, and not oppressive. And that's, to me, inspiring. We should all be very proud of the community that we live in. Are you finding any problems with some of the national textbooks you get? I know that there's some that Texas is a big supplier of, of textbooks, right. and there are stories about the way the, the history of, of slavery is mm -hmm. told, the way the Civil War is told, the way various uh, movements are, are represented. Are, mm -hmm. are you are you running into difficulty presenting an anti-racist educational experience because of the educational resources that you're, you are presented with? I think that is absolutely true. Um, uh, one of the themes that came through loud and clear on my listening tour this past year was the, um, uh, the, the uh, 
desperate need for curriculum that is historically accurate, that better represents the, um, the world that we live in. Um, I mean, it came up over and over again in my meetings with parents, with students, and with staff. And I don't know if you saw that in the framework, but one of the areas that we're going to focus on, uh, we have a small number of priority areas district-wide um, to su better support schools, is in the area of improving our um, curriculum and instructional materials so that they better represent the students that we serve. You've also got something called equity fellows, and, and what it says in the framework is utilizing a growing cohort of equity fellows who work in different capacities to offer specialized facilitation for school-based and central office staff on implicit bias, structural racism, racial identity, and racial equity. It sounds like a SWAT team of wokeness. Kind of, I, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> that group is woke, for sure. Okay, who are these equity fellows and exactly what do they do? Yeah, so uh, last year we recruited our first cohort um, it's a leadership opportunity for staff um, of all sorts um, to deepen their ability to facilitate conversations around race. And um, that group, uh, which consists of 16 people, um, some teachers, some administrators, some, uh, I mean, they, they just provide, they play a whole variety of roles in our school district. Um, they had, um, they'll be available to help uh, lead and facilitate discussions um, uh, based on uh, school and central office requests. They're a really talented bunch of, of people who've been preparing themselves over a year to begin doing uh, that work this year. And our goal is to expand that group of equity fellows over time. So uh, each year, we're thinking, we'll add a new group of equity fellows so that over time, that group just keeps expanding, expanding, expanding. Um, it's like a kind of an army, right, of equity warriors out in our school districts that are, um, that are there not to call teachers or staff members out. Um, but like as, as we, we've uh, begun to say, we want to learn how to call people in <laughs> to those conversations. So what would be an example of something they, they would do? I mean, there, there's issues at, at a school, they'd go out and then meet with teachers and staff, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, students, I mean, what exactly would they do? Well, um, I think they're still defining that um, and uh, it'll sort of grow and change over time. Um, so we should check in on it next year. Um, but I think that they'll, they'll be available to offer support during professional development time at schools across the district. Um, we have, uh, uh, I don't know how many days, and I think it's six uh, or so professional development days throughout the school year. And um, they'll make themselves available to support staff, to lead professional development in small or even large groups um, during those sessions. Uh, uh, and other similar opportunities. I think that will be heavily um, focused on professional learning time is what I suspect. But we'll see how it plays out this year. There is a section on mindfulness, which sounds a bit like it harkens back to your time in California, <laughs> especially, especially the sentence, learning to pay attention to the present moment without judgment nurtures personal well-being and supports us in bringing compassion and efficacy to our relationships with colleagues students and families this is a little ba baba ram das be here now zen in the art of homeroom mm -hmm. uh, how, how is this going to play itself out in teachers and and the school district's daily life this this yeah. concept of mindfulness it's incredibly important um again it, it uh it gets back to our, the, the beginning of our conversation about, um, about teacher and administrator well-being. Um, this is emotionally uh, challenging work, inherently emotional. Um, and if we're going to be available for our students, we have to be taking care of ourselves. If we're going to be able to engage in difficult discussions about things like race, we have to be um, uh, yeah, emotionally available to one another. And mindfulness, um, we think, is one way uh, to provide that kind of support. We have had an ongoing, very important relationship with the uh, Center for Investigating Healthy Minds um, here on campus. 
the, at the UW. Um, they have done research in our district for years on mindfulness practice for both students and staff with very positive results. Um, and we've worked with them kind of quietly over the years to train our own staff to become trainers in mindfulness um, for our teachers um, and administrators. Uh, we have been offering a variety of mindfulness courses for at least a couple of years now to staff. They get filled up <laughs> almost immediately. It's incredible the demand for mindfulness practice among the staff. Um, and we're, we're going to continue to expand those opportunities. I took our 10-hour mindfulness course just this past summer. Um, I felt like I needed some new skills and abilities to keep myself focused and present. Um, and it was phenomenal. And I've already been building it into my own leadership practice, um, which I think is, has um, already made a positive change in my own life. Uh, going for, from the macro to the, to the micro, mm -hmm. um, you're also going to talk about redesigning middle school. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have to tell you, a, a document that goes from, you know, be here now to redesign middle school is, is, is a wide-ranging document. Yeah, it is. W what does redesign middle school mean? What do you mean by that? Well, um, we know that uh, the age of middle schoolers, that those adolescent years, are very special years for young people where um, they're not only learning, but they are... Um, doing the job of developing their own sense of self and identity, right? This is what adolescents do. Um, this is where and how their brain is developing. Um, and we think that the way that's, that middle schools are structured um, aren't in uh, good enough alignment with the needs of students at that age level. So we're trying to figure out how to um, design or redesign middle schools in the coming years to be more attentive and attuned to the, the actual needs of students. Are there smaller learning communities so that students have a, a, a more sense of their uh, community? Um, is the curriculum that we're teaching or the elective options relevant right, to the life of a middle schooler? The elective options in our schools haven't changed in many years. Um, and I'm not proposing that they uh, necessarily change dramatically, but they could. Um, and they could be much more aligned to the interests uh, of middle schoolers now. We've only got one minute left, um, which is too bad because... <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> so much to talk about. Um, but I want to get very briefly, one of, one of the things is to empower principals. The two biggest controversies you faced last year related to your treatment of the principals at Leopold and Sherman. Mm. Mm -hmm. Are you completely set, very briefly, are you completely satisfied with the way those two situations were handled or the things you learned about the, the, the encounters with, with those two positions? Um, I am definitely not satisfied. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, if there are lessons, it's just a reminder about the importance of empowering not just principals, but school teams. This is about shared leadership. Um, and uh, I think it's about um, uh, supporting principals who they themselves are on, um, you know, they're on their own learning trajectories, right? It gets back to the idea of putting principals under the microscope. How can we support them in doing their best work? Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but maybe next year we can talk about yeah. uh, that in greater detail. Uh, for more information, give people the website very quickly. For more information about the Madison oh, School District. Oh, mmsd.org um, is, the, is the website, and you can see information about the strategic framework right there. It's a glossy, wonderful document. That's it for this episode of Access City Hall on the Madison City Channel. For, for Dr. Cheatham and everyone here at the Madison City Channel, uh, thanks for watching, and have a successful school year. We'll be back next month. Thanks. Thank you.